For all of you on the line, my name is Mike DeLaCluse. I'm the president of Lessman Instrument Company. I'd, I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to, do, to join us for today's webinar, where we're going to discuss pH, the basics. Uh, this will be the first of an ongoing series of three sessions. So if you like what you hear today, plan on attending our 200 level course, uh, which will be announced in the next few weeks. Today's presenter is Georgie Day. Georgie spent the last 20 years providing field support for analytical instruments and sensors for customers and industries around the world. In her current role as Senior Analytical Product Specialist for Honeywell, she's been in just about every industry helping customers like you get most uh, liquid analytical measurements worth Georgie has uh, worked at TBI Bailey, ABB, and has a uh, Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering. Today we have a large number of attendees. Uh, the phone lines are currently muted. If you have a question, there is a chat tool in the GoToWebinar uh, section of the meeting. If you would, just type your question in uh, and we'll get them in queue. If for some reason you're having a hard time logging on to GoToWebinar, what I would suggest you do is take your browser and point it at GoToWebinar.com. In the upper right-hand uh, corner, there's a button called Join Meeting. And if you have a pen handy, I'll give you the meeting ID, which is 884-243-7000. Eight eight four two four three seven seven five. It will prompt you for an email address, which you should use your own, and then it'll ask you first and last name, and then it'll let you log in and see the webinar. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. George, Georgie, if you want to just tell me when to advance slides, I'll go ahead and advance slides. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending the seminar. Uh, well, hopefully we're going to have plenty of time for questions at the end, and uh, I know the end can answer every single question that I'm able to, hopefully all of them. Uh, this morning we're going to talk about just the very basics of pH, and uh, we've got a short number of slides here, so hopefully we should be able to get through all of them. Okay, so what is pH? Uh, pH is a negative log of the hydrogen ion activity. Basically what that statement means is that uh, when you're measuring pH, you're counting hydrogen ions in the process. So if you're just looking at water, uh, water likes to come apart, it's only weakly bonded. So you end up seeing hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. And um, the pH scale is typically 0 to 14, but you can see pH is much less than 0 uh, and much higher than 14, although it's not on a scale of 0 to 14. If you're at 7 pH, then you're in neutral pH. Next slide. Uh, negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. So we're just counting hydrogen ions in the process. That's all a pH sensor does. The pH scale is 0 to 14, more or less. Uh, if you're at a pH of 7, then you can see that you have 7, 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter of hydrogen ion. So it's put together as a concentration uh, that's a neutral pH. If you're at pH of 2, then you have 10 to the minus 2 moles per liter. Uh, and the reason I put this up here is because I want you to see that pH is a log function. It's not linear, and that's why it can be very difficult to control because it gets away from you pretty easily. Next slide, Mike. There you go. Thank you. Uh, if you'll hit the button two more times, it'll pop up uh, some headers for us. There's process control and common substances. So this is just a list of some solutions, uh, some for process control and some common substances. If you look at the common substances on the right-hand side, you can see toward the middle, toward neutral, is uh, the pH of your blood. Knowing the pH of your blood is very important. Uh, your blood should be between 7.35 and 7.45. If it changes by more than a tenth of a pH, then you die. It's something called uh, acidosis of your blood. So it's very important in your body. It's also very important in your household, etc. You can see laundry bleach is a very high pH. 
Uh, lemon juice, very, very low, down to about 2 pH. Beer is about 4.3. Um, Coke and Pepsi, you can see, uh, is quite a bit more acidic, 2.45. Next page. So you can see at 2.45, go ahead and hit it again, Mike, that uh, pH, the pH of Coke or Pepsi is almost 100 times more acidic than beer at 4.3 pH. Hit it again. And one more time. So the lesson here is drink more beer. It's better, much better for you than Coke or Pepsi. Next slide. So let's talk about how a pH sensor works. pH sensor is basically a little chemical battery. It's a two electrode device. You have a measuring electrode and a reference electrode. The measuring electrode is going to be glass. Uh, pH sensitive glass, or it's going to be an IFSET, which is an ion sensitive field effect transistor. It's a piece of electronics, which is a, uh, a newer sort of device uh, in the history of uh, measuring pH. The measuring electrode is responsible for the span and response. So if you have a sensor that you put into a four buffer and a seven buffer, and say it measures four and a half and six and a half, that's a short span. Uh, or short, uh, low efficiency, um, and that's related to the glass. If you have a pH sensor that when you put it in a 4 buffer and then put it to the 7 buffer and it kind of creeps up, that's a response issue. That's also related to the glass measuring electrode. The other electrode is the reference electrode, and the reference electrode is there to maintain a constant voltage to be compared to the varying voltage on the measuring electrode. And it also completes the electrical circuit. You have to have both a measuring electrode and a reference electrode to have a complete circuit and have current to flow. And I'll show you a little diagram to help uh, fix that in your mind. Uh, when you're having trouble with your pH sensor, uh, the reference electrode is responsible for the offset. You also have a temperature. You can, you can uh, go ahead and pop forward, Mike. We also have a temperature sensor as well. So if we look at how a pH sensor is put together, you see that we have a measuring electrode, and that measuring electrode has some uh, pH sensitive glass. It has a silver, silver chloride uh, wire or element, and then behind the pH sensitive glass is an approximately seven buffered solution. So when you put that sensor into the fluid, um, it will create a voltage potential across that glass that is proportional to pH. So if we were sitting in a pH 7 solution and the pH solution behind the glass is 7, then you would get 0 millivolts across that glass. Uh, we're measuring uh, the pH based on millivolts. If it was in a 6 pH solution, then you would get 59.15 uh, millivolts or approximately 60 millivolts. If you're in a 5 solution, it would be 120 millivolts. If you jumped up to a um, 8 solution, you'd be in negative 60 millivolts, uh, and a 9 solution, negative 120 millivolts, et cetera. So when you put this into the fluid, the uh, hydrogen ions in the process react on the pH-sensitive glass, and it creates a voltage potential across the glass proportional to pH. Now, it's a high impedance glass. It has a lot of resistance. So you also have to have a high impedance voltmeter. Go ahead and hit it, Mike. So the high impedance voltmeter is your input device, either your transmitter or your, your uh, pH analyzer. Uh, you could not take a pH sensor and just connect it to, say, a multimeter that reads millivolts and expect to get a reasonable meet, uh, reading because there's so little current running through here. Uh, the pH glass is hundreds of megaohms of impedance, and you're measuring at a uh, millivolt signal. So that means you only have picoamp to current. So you have to have this high impedance voltmeter, which is essentially the front end of a pH sensor. Uh, go ahead and hit it, Mike. So <clears throat> to finish making this measurement, to get current to flow through your voltmeter, you have to have a second uh, electrode. Just like if you went out to try and measure the, the voltage on your car battery, if I gave you a voltmeter with only one lead on it and said, go tell me what the voltage is on your car battery, you would not be able to do that because you have to have two leads, one to touch to the positive 
and one to the negative. And when you do that, current flows through the voltmeter and it gives you a reading. A pH sensor works the same way. The pH sensor is like a battery. You have to have those two poles connected to your transmitter or your analyzer. So the second pole is your reference electrode, and it provides a reference voltage to compare to the varying voltage of the pH sensor. So if you just had this silver silver chloride wire hanging in the process, uh, the pH sensor wouldn't read co correctly because the wire is in contact with the fluid, which is changing, so that voltage is varying. Additionally, the wire could be, the voltage, the reference wire could be consumed or damaged by the process. Uh, next slide. So what we do is we put it into a uh, potassium chloride liquid or a gel. And what that does is it fixes the voltage potential at the reference electrode so that it stays constant. And as long as it's constant, it can be compared to the varying voltage of the measuring electrode. The problem with the setup that you're currently seeing is you have no connection between the measuring electrode and the reference electrode. So uh, next slide. So we have to add a porous liquid junction. And that porous liquid junction allows electrical flow or current flow between the measuring electrode through the uh, process fluid and up to the reference electro up to the porous liquid junction into the gel, which is an electrolyte. It helps carry the current to the reference electrode and current flows, and you're able to see the pH at your instrument. Next slide. And one more time. Okay. So that's how your pH sensor works. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go back one. Uh, so let's talk about how to install your pH sensor. Again, this is just the very basics, but I can answer questions all the way through your worst pH nightmare, hopefully. Um, the installation is extremely important. If you don't install it in a good place, a smart place, then you end up visiting it all the time. And what I frequently see when I visit plants is that people put the sensor in an easy-to-get-to place, which is usually also uh, a lousy place to put the pH sensor because it gets crapped up and it doesn't see good flow, etc. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so a smart place is not necessarily going to be an easy to get to place. It's helpful if it's easy to get to, but you want to get it in a place where it's going to stay clean and see real live data all the time, not be back in a hole or someplace where it's not seeing the process flow or someplace where the flow is so slow or non-existent that it's not seeing you know, new fluid all the time and it's getting crapped up. So with that in mind, the um, ideal installation is going to be in a main process line or in a slipstream, something that has good flow. Uh, it's best if that uh, line is horizontal. Um, you want to stay in a horizontal line rather than in a vertical line if all possible. Uh, the installation of the sensor should be between 1 and 5 o'clock. And what I mean by that is if you're looking down the face of the pipe uh, and you think of that as a clock, you want your sensor to be installed somewhere between the 1 o'clock position and the 5 o'clock position. Now, if you're using, depending on the type of pH technology you're using, that may have to be between 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock because many pH sensors cannot go, cannot be turned upside down. Uh, but you can turn some of ours upside down. It just depends on the technology. If you, you don't want to install it at 12 o'clock straight in the top because there's almost always entrained air in processes and air bubbles rise to the top, and so the air bubbles would be hit, hitting the face of the pH sensor. And that would give you a very noisy measurement because the pH sensor is made to measure liquids. You can't really see the, uh, the air, the air bubbles, and so it makes it very, very noisy. So you wouldn't want to install it at 1 o'clock. You also wouldn't want to install a pH sensor at 6 o'clock because if you have any particulates uh, or anything that could drop out of the process, that gravity is going to make that flow to the bottom, and so that would be a very, very dirty installation. You'd have to clean it a lot. You want to put the sensor in uh, non-flashing areas. A flashing area, uh, if you have a hot process, that's going to be any place you have a pipe chain. So if you have, uh, say, an elbow or a pump or a valve or an expansion in the size of your pipe, 
when the fluid, the hot fluid, goes through that expansion, it will flash into the vapor phase. Uh, one, that makes the, the uh, pH reading very, very noisy, but it also will damage some of the components inside the pH sensor. A lot of the seals that are in pH sensors are made strictly for liquids. They're not made for vapors of any kind. So you don't want to be in a flashing area. The face of the pH sensor should be at 90 degrees to the flow. Uh, so what that means is when you install it in your horizontal pipe, you push it in or if you push it into the side of a tank, the flow should be have a wiping action on the face of the sensor. You don't want the flow going face into the pH sensor because that coats the measuring electrode and it forces process fluid up into the liquid junction, which will start to poison the reference and cause you to have drift in your sensor. So 90 degrees to the flow. The ideal velocity for your pH sensor is going to be between 3 and 5 feet per second. That's fast enough to give a good wiping action and not get plugged up on the sensor, but not so fast that you start introducing noise or start pummeling the sensor with, uh, you know, just beating it up with a process. Because remember, it's almost always glass or a FET, and eventually glass can get a crack in it. Uh, you want to always keep the sensor wet and sometimes you have to do some little tricky things. There's all kinds of things you can do to keep it wet, but it has to stay wet. If the sensor dries out, two things happen. One, the glass measuring electrode becomes dehydrated. Uh, it's a hydrated glass, so, and you have to have that hydration so that you have a liquid. It's in the liquid process. The glass is hydrated, and you have liquid behind it so that the voltage can carry to that measuring electrode, that wire behind the glass. Uh, so you always have to keep it wet. Uh, the other reason you have to keep it wet is because the reference electrode or the, the liquid junction will start to dry out and that will cause an air pocket inside the chamber that houses the reference electrode. And air is more mobile in a reference electrode, reference system, than even process fluid. So it can kill the sensor very, very quickly. So you must always keep the sensor wet. And re-wetting re a sensor that's been dried out usually just traps air inside and it'll look like it works for a little while and then it'll crap out on you. Uh, finally, you want a, uh, if you have to do a vertical pipe, and I've seen lots of installations where you have to do vertical pipes instead of a horizontal pipe, you want to do that as an upflow only for two reasons. Um, if you have a downflow pipe, there can be periods of time where that pipe doesn't have any flow in it. Um, so you could have a drying action. But what I've seen more often than that is in a downflow pipe, because you can't guarantee the fullness of that pipe uh, as the fluid is flowing through it, you get what is called water hammer, where, it's in, where you have instantaneous um, and fast periods of no flow and then flow. And that just beats the snot out of your pH sensor. And basically, a pH sensor is a laboratory device that we just keep trying to make more and more able to withstand the rigors of process. So you want to, you know, try not to speed it up as much as possible. Next slide, please. So sometimes you have to do submersion app applications or installations. I'd say probably close to half of the installations I look at are submersion installations. So that would be in an open channel or a tank. You want to make sure you have some velocity or agitation, especially uh, in a large uh, volume, because if you don't, you're not going to see much changes in your pH. You won't have a well-mixed uh, solution to really see what's going on. Uh, so you want some velocity or agitation. If you, if you have a mixer, you want to install the sensor into that tank such that the flow is at the right angle to the face of the sensor or at 90 degrees to the face of the sensor. Again, so you're not pushing fluid up inside. The sensor has to always stay wet. And a lot of submersion applications have changing levels of um, the fluid. And so sometimes your sensor can end up not being wet. And again, drying out, A, it doesn't give you a reading, and B, you're damaging, damaging the sensor. You also need to protect pH sensors and all analytical sensors, really, pH, conductivity, DO. All of those have to have the back end protected from moisture. Even though we and all manufacturers build these sensors so that they uh, are sealed in the back end, 
is impossible to take a flexible item like a cable and seal it 100% to an inflexible item, i.e. the body, et cetera, of the sensor. So when you install in a uh, submersion type application, you must use uh, a PVC or other material pipe. You use Teflon tape. You screw the sensor back up into the back of that so that it's protected and so that it's not hanging by the cable. Um, you know, you'd never uh, take your, your iPod and swing it around by the cable. You wouldn't want to do that with your pH sensor either. Uh, it's good if you can make your uh, connections above the liquid level whenever possible. If you're using something like uh, Honeywell's DuraFet, then you would want to make that, you have to make that connection right at the back of the sensor. Uh, but if you're using something that has a, a cable, uh, an integral cable, then you can make that uh, connection higher. The reason we like to do that is because uh, lots of places, you have a lot of steam, it gets hot, you get condensate in the back of the pipe. And I've seen, you know, where people have taken their sensor out and they pull the sensor out and, you know, a cup of water or condensate falls out of the pipe. And that can cause a problem over time. Now with the DuraFet, of course, you have, hopefully you would be using the DuraFet 3, which has a very open connection. And if you've made that connection correctly, you should be good and tight. You shouldn't have problems with it. Next. Slide, please. So other things that you want to think about when you're installing your pH sensor. Um, you need to run the signal cable alone in the conduit. You can run it uh, next to other, uh, other like pH and conductivity signal cables, but it should never ever be running alongside next to uh, your power cable or power that's running through relays, et cetera. Uh, it shouldn't be going next to uh, large motors or large pumps. Because remember I said that you have a very low signal, only picoamps of current, and only takes a small amount of uh, current uh, or noise, electrical noise, to disturb a pH signal. Um, you also want to uh, install it in places that are not stagnant, like in a flow cell, where you have you know, a small amount of flow turnover and maybe dead spots in the flow cell. And you want to install it near your, your transmitter or your analyzer, because you're going to have to calibrate the pH sensor. You're going to have to clean and calibrate it. There's no avoiding it, no matter what your process rule it is. Uh, and you don't want to have to have two men to do a calibration, one standing at the instrument with a radio pushing buttons and one at the sensor, you know, putting it in various solutions. Um, it makes it a lot more difficult. Um, and talking about the, uh, the signal and protecting the signal, one thing that you should not do with a pH sensor, certainly with a pH sensor that has a glass measuring electrode, is take the cable and wind it up in a coil and hang it up someplace. Because when you do that, what you've done is you've made a nice big antenna. So that if there is any electrical noise uh, in the area, you're just asking it to uh, jump on and mess up your signal. Next slide, please. OK, calibration. When you calibrate, basically you're calibrating the um, inaccuracies in the pH sensor, and you're doing that by making an adjustment to the electronics. Uh, there's a couple ways to do that. You can actually do an electronic um, calibration on your instrument. Most modern instruments, uh, that would just be a reset, which would reset the um, offset to zero millivolts and the uh, pH span to 100%. Um, mostly what you'll do is either a grab sample or you'll use standard solutions like buffers. Next slide, please. So when you're going to do a calibration with buffers, that's usually called a two-point calibration. Uh, next. So you would put it in your first buffer. That could be a four buffer. Uh, I usually recommend using four and seven buffers. And we can discuss why uh, the whys of that uh, during the question and answer period. But you put it in your four buffer, and you get a measurement. So what's happening is the pH sensor is generating a voltage signal. 
and based on 100% efficiency, because that's how the, the instrument comes to you, um, it will generate a uh, uh, reading of 4 pH on the instrument. And if it doesn't read 4 pH on the instrument, then you do uh, you dial it in by changing the value. Okay, then you go ahead and rinse it off. You put it in your 7 buffer. Next slide. And you get your 7 pH value. Uh, one more time, Mike. And what that does is it draws a line. Sorry, that line doesn't go perfectly through my 4. I had sort of trouble getting that in there. It draws a line, and it's just a line with the algebraic uh, equation of y equals mx plus b. So what it's telling you is that, uh, one more time, hit the button one more time, Mike. Um, the line that we're looking at here has uh, a slope, which is m, of 59.15 millivolts per pH unit, and it has no offset, zero millivolts to offset. So that's theoretically a perfect sensor. You're not going to get that with a brand new sensor. There's going to be some tiny bit of, usually a little bit of offset and a tiny bit of uh, less than 100% efficiency. Like 99, most class pH sensors, big quality ones, uh, will have a 99.8 or higher efficiency. So they're almost perfect, but not quite. So here's your theoretically perfect sensor, or maybe a brand new sensor. So let's look at what happens when you go out and you calibrate a sensor that's been in the process for a while. Next slide. <clears throat> so here you are calibrating an old sensor. You put it in the first buffer, and you can see that it's reading a little uh, off on the first buffer. Go ahead and hit it again, Mike. And then you put it in your second buffer. It looks pretty good around the midpoint, which is the neutral point, but it's a little low on the 4 pH. One more time, Mike. So it's going to draw this new line, and this new line becomes your operating line in the instrument. So anytime you put the sensor into a fluid, it's going to get a millivolt signal, and it's going to go out to that line and drop down and give you the pH reading. So it's your new operating line. Uh, let's hit it again, Mike. <clears throat> so this particular pH sensor has a um, has a slope of only 50.15 millivolts per pH unit. So we've lost 9 millivolts per pH unit, uh, but it has a perfect uh, perfect offset of 0 millivolts. It's not offset at all. So what that tells us when you get that measurement is that the sensor's glass measuring side uh, has a low slope or efficiency. Those are interchangeable terms. And what that means is either the sensor's dirty or the active sites that the hydrogen ions land on are actually getting used up. Next slide. So let's look at what we do when we have a single point calibration, which is also called a grab sample calibration. And that's where you go to the process. The process pH sensor stays in the process. Uh, and you pull a sample into a beaker and you measure it with a previously calibrated handheld device. So you take your measurement, and let's say that your process is at 6 pH. Uh, so you take that measurement, and then you put the new value into the instrument. Uh, next. And it will draw your new operating line. And that new operating line, if you notice, has the exact same slope as your previous operating line. So we have made no adjustment in relation to the health of the glass. We've now made an adjustment on the reference side. So what this says is that you have a perfect slope of 59.15 millivolts, but you have an offset of 50 millivolts, which is almost one pH unit. So you have the glass is pretty right on. It's not aged. It's not dirty. Uh, but the reference has an offset. And references will develop offsets over time in the process because the process fluid uh, leaching into the liquid junction and creating a very complex chemistry between the potassium chloride on the inside of the sensor, the process fluid on the outside. In that liquid junction area, you get a very complex chemistry. And it creates what's called a, um, a junction potential. So it adds some voltage or voltage potential to that side of the sensor. And so to fix it, you dial that out using this uh, single point calibration. Next slide, please. So to do a one point process calibration, 
it's important that your sensor, if you've taken it out and done a, uh, if it's been in the process for a while, you took it out and you did a two-point calibration, you want to put it back into the process and wait for somewhere between 50 and 30 minutes. I usually wait 30 minutes because I'm kind of conservative and I want to get a good calibration so that it can come to up to the process temperature and so it can equilibrate with the chemistry of the process so that liquid junction can get into equilibrium with the inside of the sensor and the process fluid next. <clears throat> so the next thing you do is you want to take a sample of your process. If the process fluid is hot, you want a good size um, container to take that uh, into uh, a beaker or a big cup or however you're going to do your, your uh, collector sample. But you want a good size so that it maintains its uh, thermal integrity, so it maintains its heat. You don't want to allow it to cool, and you want to use a portable uh, pH sensor that has an automatic temperature compensation. Um, and then you're going to go ahead and measure it with that. Next slide. Hey, Georgie, we have a question uh, that's popped up. Yes. I think we want to probably address it here as opposed to keep moving on. Okay, question go ahead. Was, what are the advantages of using single point versus two point calibration? Okay, They're, they are both advantageous and you have to do both of them. So let me give you a little um, kind of process to follow. When you have a brand new sensor, the first thing you do is you uh, do a two-point calibration using buffers. And you do that to establish the, um, the slope of the measuring electrode, whether it's a set, uh, a Duraset, or whether it's a glass measuring electrode. You have to establish that slope. And you do that with your two-point calibration with buffers. Then the next thing you do is you put it in your process, wait a half an hour, and you do a grab sample calibration. And you do that grab sample calibration to adjust for, your, uh, for the effect of the process on the reference side of the sensor. And you will always need to do that. OK, so now your sensor is set up. You've done your two-point cal for the glass, and you've done your one-point calibration um, in the process. And so now it's running along. So maybe, you know, depending on your process, maybe you check the calibration once a week or every day or how whatever is required of your process. So it's time to calibrate it. The thing you would do is go out and take a grab sample calibration and make a one-point adjustment. Um, and you would do that until it's time to clean the sensor. When it's time to clean the sensor, then you take the sensor out and you clean it. Now when you clean the sensor, you're actually changing the offset in the liquid junction because the liquid junction is getting clean. And you're also changing the slope on the uh, glass or FET because you're cleaning debris that's collected on there that may be hiding the active sites from the hydrogen ions. And so you're cleaning all that off. In the meantime, the sensor, the glass measuring electrode has also aged in that hydrogen ions have been used off the, the measuring electrode. So when you take it out to clean it, you two-point calibrate it in a buffer. And you want to make sure that when you clean it, you rinse it very, very well, because a lot of stuff gets stuck in there. Um, sorry, let me get back to I lost the presentation for a second. Um, so you want to make sure that you get that all very, very rinsed out once you take it out of the process and once you clean it, then you do your two-point calibration because you have to reset the slope on the glass because it's changing all the time. Uh, and you clean debris off of there. Then you put it back in the process. You wait 30 minutes. You do a grab sample. So the idea is whenever you clean the sensor, you two-point cal, put it back in, and then wait, and then grab sample. And then you take grab samples in between your cleaning to make sure that the sensor continues to read uh, correctly in the process. Now, when you do your, does that answer the question? Let me pause there for a moment. I think that answers the question. Thank you. Are we good? Yeah, we're good. OK. So. <clears throat> Once, once you, when you do that, when you do your grab sample calibration, it's really, really important to do it correctly. Um, and 
depending on your parameters for your process, some people are trying to control all the way in the hundred area, which is really incredibly tricky in a live process. Some folks are happy if they're within half a pH or more. Uh, so it depends on your parameters. But in general, uh, if you only if you go out and you uh, you know do a grab sample and you're off by a tenth or two tenths, you don't really want to make a change in that unless you see that in three successive samples showing the same error. Because what happens is if you are calibrating or checking the calibration, say every shift and you're running three shifts. You could be, the day shift guy could be chasing the tail of the night shift because not everybody does their calibrations the same. And that's like a whole other discussion, how to get everybody doing them exactly the same. But you could be, you know, day shift adjusted up a tenth, night shift adjusted down a tenth. Everybody's complaining because it's never right. And that's because we're not doing the exact same thing on the day shift and the night shift. So if you don't have, like if, if your sample is off by a tenth, but the next time it's not, um, you can see that you should not have made that, should not have made a change. Uh, next, please. Uh, this comes from Greg McMillan, who is uh, in the pH geek circles that I run in. He is like the god of pH. Greg McMillan um, is a pH expert. He's been a pH expert for 30 or 40 years, I think. Uh, a long time. He's written several books on pH, which I am looking at on my bookshelf as I'm doing this uh, presentation. And Greg says, unless there's a consistent error of 0.25 or more, you should not be making an adjustment. Now, a consistent error means that if you're off, you know, 0.2 or 0.25 or more, um, then you should um, take another grab sample to see where you're at to make sure that, you know, you really do have some error in your pH before you make that change. Next slide. So, um, so that's uh, calibration. So let's talk a little bit about maintenance. If you don't maintain your sensor, uh, you're going to be out there calibrating it a lot, and you're going to be throwing it away a lot. I have customers that do not clean their sensors ever. And so they throw away a lot of perfectly good sensors because, you know, they get crapped up and they can't see the process and they get slow and they get an offset. So you have to clean them. And it is important to clean them before you get catastrophic coating. <clears throat> if you have, I'll give you a, a little analogy here. If you have a nice tile floor in your kitchen and your dining room, and you have uh, three, three kids and two dogs and a muddy backyard, and they're always running in and out, in and out, which kids and dogs do all the time, uh, they get your floor pretty dirty. And if you only mop that floor, swept them off that floor once a month, <clears throat> after a few months, you would not be able to get the floor clean, even if you were in there scrubbing the heck out of it with your mop, trying to get it clean. You wouldn't be able to get it clean because the, the crud, from all the traffic and the dirt, et cetera, builds up and just creates this layer. And it's the same thing with anything that's in the process. So when your pH sensor is in the process, if you don't clean it often enough, it gets like this baseline coating. And so you clean it, and it seems to be better, but um, if you're not cleaning it enough, it, each time you clean it, you get it a little less clean. And so that basically shortens the lifespan of your sensor. So you have to figure out how often to clean it and then make sure that you do that cleaning so that the sensor lasts a good long time. Uh, next slide. So there's a couple ways you can clean your sensor. You can use both chemical and physical cleaning on it. You have to be careful, of course, especially if you're using a glass measuring electrode. Next slide. Uh, to make sure that you don't break it. So if you're going to do uh, physical cleaning, you can wipe it with a rag, a clean rag, um, or uh, a clean wipe, or you can use uh, a toothbrush. Uh, I like to say don't clean your pH sensor with anything that you wouldn't clean your teeth with. So you wouldn't want to use a wire acid brush in your mouth. You wouldn't want to use it on your pH sensor because it's likely to damage the sensor. 
and you can do a gentle scrub. Toothbrushes work great. I always keep one in my tool bag. Uh, I always, that's where all my recycled toothbrushes go. They go right into my tool bag. Next slide, please. So you can use, uh, and you can use a little bit of el elbow grease. You just want to be careful with it, you know, so that you don't break anything. Um, <clears throat> you also will probably need to use some sort of chemical cleaning. Lots and lots of people just clean with water, and water is, it is a universal solvent, but it's, you know, depending on what's crapped up your sensor, it's going to be, it may take more than just water and, and a toothbrush to clean it. So in general, because uh, all pH processes, all, I'm sorry, all processes are different. I've, I've seen probably hundreds of thousands of processes at this point in my career, and every single one of them is different chemically. Um, so there is no one thing that you can use that will clean a pH sensor. It's not what you're cleaning, it's what you're trying to take off of the sensor that will decide what you use chemically to clean with. Uh, if you're in a low pH application, something below 7, then typically a weak caustic solution or something that's weakly basic will do a pretty decent job removing the uh, whatever's on there. If you're in a high pH application, then you'd want to use a weak acid solution. Next slide, please. So you can see acids clean off bases and bases clean off acids in general. Uh, a general purpose cleaner that uh, my customers have been concocting for many years uh, requires one part of four normal sulfuric acid, one part of 10% hydrochloric acid, and two parts of either methanol or isopropyl alcohol. Um, and then you uh, mix it up. You should always, if you're going to mix chemicals, make sure you do it under uh, a fume hood and make sure you wear your goggles and your gloves, etc. cetera. Um, and then you can soak it from two to 10 minutes. Soak the sensor in that uh, for, for two to ten minutes and then rinse very, very well with tap water. Remember, whatever you put the sensor into is going to soak up in the liquid junction. So you have to give it some help to come out of the liquid junction so that you're not making that chemistry in the liquid junction even more complex than it already is. Uh, this is a very good general purpose cleaner. A simpler one, next slide please, is going to be just straight hydrochloric acid. And lots and lots of people use this. Uh, most plants have it on site. You want to use uh, a 5 to 10 percent solution of hydrochloric acid. That's 1 to 3 molar. And you soak your uh, sensor for 2 to 10 minutes and then rinse it very, very well in tap water. When you're using chemicals on a pH sensor, more is never better. Do not use a stronger uh, solution than what's recommended. And don't soak it for longer. I have some guys at a power plant that were using the hydrochloric acid that came in bulk and soaking the sensor for two or three hours. And their sensor life was like two weeks <laughs> because they were killing the sensor. Whatever you put the sensor into, it has to get living in that environment. And they were using 35% hydrochloric acid, which has a pH, I think, of about minus 1.2. Remember I said the pH scale is 0 to 14, but there are lower and higher values. Well, hydrochloric acid in bulk at 35% is a negative pH value, and it was destroying the pH sensors. So uh, more is not better. You want to use, five to, in this case, 5 to 10% hydrochloric and soak for 2 to 10 minutes and rinse very well. Next slide, please. That's for inorganic scale. If you have water hardness, if you're in a place like I am, I'm in Reno, Nevada, and we have very, very hard water here. Um, you know, you don't want the sprinkler blowing water on your car because then you get stuff all over the car stuck on there, hard water spots. So if you have hard water, then you'd want to do uh, a little bit longer soak. Again, still 5 to 10 percent hydrochloric. That usually cleans it off, again, if you are, um, you know, doing a regular maintenance on your sensor. Next slide. <clears throat> So when you clean your sensors, um, the reason that your slope gets low, when you put it in your 4 buffer and your 7 buffer, on uh, it reads less than 3 pH span. That's a low slope. And that's pointing right at the measuring electrode. And it's either dirty or it's dying, or both. Um, you know, that's 
that's on your measuring electrode, and that means that you need to try and clean it. So a lot of the, the um, things that crap up a pH sensor, you're not going to be able to see, especially when it's wet. I mean, if you have a dirty windshield, but it's wet, um, you're not really going to be able to see the dirt on the windshield. So what you can do is, uh, you know, let the sensor air dry and look at it and shine a light to there or hold it up to a light or up to the sun if you're outside um, and take a look. And sometimes you can see uh, some scale on the sensor. Although it's only a positive check, it's not a negative check. If you don't see any scale, that doesn't mean that it's not crapped up. There's all kinds of things that can uh, foul the sensor that you're not going to be able to see. Also, there's no such thing as a universal cleaner. Um, you know, the cleaner is going to be dependent on what you're trying to remove. Uh, hot water can be a pretty good cleaner, especially if you're using some sort of automatic cleaning system, say where you have something that periodically squirts the face of the electrode in the process uh, to clean it. Hot water is good because usually you can put hot water in the process and not have a problem. But a lot of times you need something more than just water. 5% hydrochloric is really good, but acids, an acid is not going to clean a sensor that got fouled in acidic conditions. You're going to have to have a base. Uh, most soaps are bases, um, so you can use a soap, but usually if you use soap, just like if you're washing your dishes, when you use soap, it works a lot better if it's in hot water. So if you're going to, if you have to use, if you're in acidic condition and you're trying to clean and you're using ammonia or sodium hydroxide, um, it's better if it's warmed up. And again, if you're going to warm it up, you probably need to do that sort of business under a fume hood so that you don't gash yourself. Um, additionally, um, you, if you use soap, uh, you may need more than just a water rinse. If you live in Nevada, a water rinse will do it because it's, well, it's hard water and it'll take that soap right off. But if you're living, say, someplace in the south where your water is kind of soft, uh, you know, if you take a shower, I notice I travel a lot, and when I go to places that have soft water, I notice when I get done showering and rinsing, I still feel like I have soap on me. And so I usually have to take a towel to wipe it off. Um, well, it's the same thing with your pH sensor. So you may have to take a cloth and rub off that pH sensor after you have rinsed it with your soft water. Again, it's okay to touch the glass. Uh, you can use a soft toothbrush. Uh, or a cloth. I don't recommend using like a dirty rag or something that's got, you know, something stiff on it or your shirt tail. I mean, you could use your shirt tail in an emergency, but remember, you don't want to damage what you're cleaning. Next slide, please. After you clean your sensor, you've had it in chemicals. It's, you know, those chemicals are now on the sensor, have been sucked up into the liquid junction. Uh, you got to rinse it really, really well and then put it back in the process um, and let it come to equilibrium before you attempt a calibration. Um, you don't want to put it directly into a buffer right after you've cleaned it because you're going to have some of that acid or base up in the liquid junction. It will leach out into your buffer and it will contaminate the buffer and cha actually change the pH right around the measuring electrode. So if you're going to, once you've cleaned it, uh, you probably want to do a two-point calibration with buffers and then reinstall it and do a scrap sample. So my suggestion is just put it in a bucket of water and let it sit, in, or, or a container of water of some sort, and just let it sit for five or ten minutes so that that can pull the, um, the rest of the acid or base out of liquid junction. Then you can do your two-point cal and then you put it back in your process and let it sit for 30 minutes and then do your grab sample. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do you tell when your sensor needs a replacement? You know, the best thing to do is give it a little health checkup, which you're doing all the time anyway when you're doing calibrations and cleaning. Um, what you want to do is rather than do a calibration, just take your sensor, give it a good rinse, uh, put it in the floor buffer, record the value, um, and then rinse it and put it in your seven buffer and record that value. And uh, you should see at least 90% span. Uh, so the, 
the difference between 7 and 4, 7 minus 4 is 3, 90% of 3 is 2.7. So you should see at least 2.7 pH units between a 4 and a 7 buffer. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't need calibration, it's just trying to decide if you've got 90% of your active sites still active. Um, so you should see at least 90% of your span. It should respond very quickly. If you see your response should be at least 90% of its final reading within 30 seconds. This is on a used sensor. At least 10 seconds if you're using uh, a DuraFed. Uh, if it's slower than that, uh, you could have a problem. When you put your sensor into the 4 buffer and the 7 buffer, your offset should be less than 2 pH. That means if you put it in a 4 buffer and it reads 5 and you put it in a 7 buffer and it reads uh, 8, you still have a 3 pH span and you're still under the 2 pH offset. So you're good to go. Remember, you're going to develop an offset over time in your pH sensor and it shouldn't be worrisome as long as you can 2 point cal and 1 point cal it, you're good to go. If you fail any of these tests or things are looking shaky, if it's a slow response, or short spanning, or if it's got a ginormous offset, um, then the next thing to do is to try cleaning it. So you go through your cleaning procedure, and if that does not remedy the problem, what that should be telling you is that either, depending on if it's you know a spanner response issue, that means that the glass measuring electrode is probably getting low on active sites. When you're down to 90% of the active sites still remaining, the sensor becomes so sluggish and short spanning that it's time to get rid of it and replace it. Uh, or conversely, if you have uh, a greater than 2 pH offset, uh, even after you've cleaned, that's telling you that the reference side is probably getting poisoned uh, or plugged up. And again, it's time to replace the sensor. Next slide. Okay, now's your opportunity to ask questions before I throw the last slide at you. Fire away. Dorothy, we have a question. Is there any time a three-point calibration has benefit? Um, a three-point calibration doesn't make any sense. A three-point check uh, can be somewhat beneficial. And let me clarify what I mean by not making sense on the three-point calibration. Um, if you think back on the graphs that we used earlier in the presentation where uh, you're drawing an operating line in the instrument, uh, whenever you do a calibration, it draws this operating line that tells the instrument, if I see 47 millivolts, hop over to that line, drop down, I have this many, this much pH, and it displays the pH. Um, to draw a line, if, if you had algebra or you're, and you actually remember any of it. Uh, most of us don't, uh, except for the geeks like me. Uh, it takes only two points to specify a line. So if you put in, let's say you use a four buffer, and you put, put in one point, and then you put, in a, put it in a seven buffer, you've designated a second point, and that automatically draws a line, and that line is of a specific slope based on going to those two points. If you were to do a third point, what that would do is it would adjust the pH, the, that line, your operating line between your second point and your third point. So you've just walked over the top of your first point cal. pH is not linear, it's logarithmic, but when you do the, uh, when you draw the operating line for the millivolt value versus pH, it is absolutely linear, so it wouldn't make sense to like have be able to set the instrument up to do a three-point cal where you'd have like maybe a uh, a drop off in your um, so you'd have like two line segments that weren't of the same slope. Uh, that wouldn't make sense because it will be the p the voltage versus pH relationship is linear. Um, for a brand new sensor, 59.15 millivolts per pH unit. And that holds true all the way until you get to about uh, a half a pH and below. And uh, 
about 13 and a half pH and above. Then the, the measuring device starts doing kind of funny things. You get this little curve going on at those ends. So if you have a pH, um, if you have a situation where you're measuring very, very high pH or very, very low pH, besides the fact that it's going to beat the sensor up and make it die quickly, um, you've got other problems to deal with. But in general, for most, like 99% of the applications, you draw just a straight line. So it wouldn't make sense to do a three-point calibration. Now, you may want to do a three-point check just to ensure to yourself that your pH sensor is really working correctly. But I can tell you that what you do when you set the slope and how the pH sensor functions is it's going to be a millivolt value per pH unit. So it's going to be a straight line throughout the scale. Um, so the reason that I would discourage a three-point, even a three-point check, really, I mean, you could check it, you could do a four pH and a seven pH and then check it in 10, but I really, truly dislike 10 buffers. Well, it's not that I dislike 10 buffers. I really like four buffers and seven buffers, or 4.01s and 6.86s, depending on whether you're using NIST buffers or uh, USA buffers, et cetera. I like those values because those two buffers are hold their value extremely well with changing temperature, and they hold their value extremely well with contamination. Basically, a buffer is just a solution that has a lot of salt in it that is at a specific pH value that, that it will stay at that value even when you contaminate it somewhat. But when you step away from those two buffers, like into a 10 buffer or a 9.18 or a 12.45 buffer, those buffers contaminate much more easily. So what happens is you've taken the sensor out of the process, it's got process fluid in the liquid junction, you've had it in another buffer, it's gotten that in there, you stick it in, say, a 10 buffer. What happens is whatever you, whatever's in the the liquid junction is leaching out right around the measuring electrode, so you gain localized contamination. If you have a really, really good buffer, like a 4 buffer or 7 buffer, it will still hold its value against that contamination. But when, it, when you get into these other buffers, they don't hold it as well, and so you'll get a bit of an error. And if you're doing a calibration, you want to use uh, calibration devices or standards that are as highly accurate as possible. The last thing you want to want to do is introduce error into some, something where you're trying to take the error out. So right. three-point cows, you can't do a three-point cow on most instruments, uh, which I feel is correct. Um, and you could do that third point check, but the problem is the thing that you're going to check it in on the third point may or may not be very accurate. Um, Archie, does great, that answer the question? Great explanation. Yeah, great explanation. You actually answered the next question too, which was, can you use a ten point uh, or a, a, a ten pH buffer rather than a four? And you, you explained yes. that quite, quite well. Also. Okay, and let me just add something to that because I get a a lot of people, you know, people that have been running their processes for years, and their procedure says. I have to use a 7 buffer and a 10 buffer because the pH of my process is 9. So I need to be something that brackets my pH value, which intuitively makes sense. But in reality, it doesn't make sense because your pH of your, your process is of a particular chemistry. Uh, so say it's at 9 pH or 9.2 or whatever. It has a particular chemistry. The chemistry of those buffers is completely different from your process chemistry. So you're not really on a chemical level bracketing your process. You just pick these two numbers that are values that are on either side. But you're not buying yourself anything by trying to bracket the process because it's chemically so different from the buffers. All right, one of the other questions we have is uh, what are your thoughts on measuring very clean, pure water? And oh. Archie, I, know, I know you have some thoughts on this, so you, and, and we're a little over time, so you might <laughs> abbreviate it just a little bit. Okay. 
Here's, here's the short version. High purity water has very few ions in it. And because it has very few ions in it, it's very, remember I showed you the picture of the two electrodes? We're counting on the process fluid to carry the current of the sensor between the measuring electrode and the liquid junction and then in through the reference. When you have high purity water, there's not enough ions to carry that current. So lots and lots of weird things happen when you measure high purity water. Um, you have to have a flowing reference. You have to dose potassium chloride into the flow chamber so that it has so that it creates an electrical connection between the measure and the reference. Um, you have to have extremely good grounding because you get a voltage buildup. Um, you have to do special things when you're in high purity water, and you have to do your calibrations in a special way. Um, one of I gave uh, the folks at Lessman a list of um, presentations that I'd be happy to give, and one of them is uh, on high purity water pH, you know, installation calibrations, uh, all of that, because it is it's a very it's easy, really easy on the equipment unlike most process pH, but it's one of the most difficult measurements to make because it has all these peculiarities and you really, really have to do everything exactly right or you get nothing but a bad headache. That's my short version. All right. One of the other questions we have is if I can't wrap the cable or cut the cable between the transmitter and sensor, what do I do? Well, you try to get the right distance of cable. Um, that's that's the first thing. So if you're dealing with something like a uh, Durafet, you're sort of stuck because you can only get 20 feet or 50 feet, which I have gone round and round with the product managers and the engineers for the last eight years on that issue, and they're not willing to budge. The good news with a Durafet is because it's a powered device, Durafets work different than glass, um, you're going to see less issues but you should try to get, you know, the shortest possible cable that will still reach your instrument without coiling it up. But if you're going to coil up a pH cable, the Duraset would be the one to coil because it is powered. So you get a little bit of fudge factor on that in terms of the effect of noise. If you're doing a glass measurement, you need to have as close to the right distance as you can get. Some of our sensors, like the Meridians, come only with 20 and 50, only with 20 feet, actually, because you have to uh, preamplify after that. Um, our HB series, you can get with a uh, with a junction box and then various lengths of extension cable. You can get them with a five foot cable, a 15, uh, or a 30 foot cable. So that we've broken down some in there, but. Your best pH installation is going to be an instrument with a sensor right next to it and five feet of cable. That's going to be, like, that's perfect because you have enough cable, you know, so you can unscrew it out of the pipe and be able to do your calibration in, in your buffers and clean it and stick it back in, but you don't have so much that you might have to roll it up. You don't have so much that a lot of that cable is being exposed to electrical noise. So. I also understand, having spent so much time in plants, that you have to bend and break the rules a fair amount. So when I tell you, you know, don't coil it up, that's, I'm, again, telling you ideally what to do. But I also understand that, you know, you got to make adjustments. But you need to know that that could be, if you're having problems, that could be something that's causing you a problem, is that coil a cable, because it is definitely making an antenna. All right. George, so yeah, you can't cut the cable. <laughs> Georgie, here's a great question for you. Uh huh. If I have beer, how often do I calibrate? If you have beer, how yeah. often do you calibrate? Well, you know, the original pH sensor back in the caveman days was your taste buds. So I say use an original pH sensor and calibrate often. Okay. Uh, Next question we have is, any special considerations when measuring cooling water pH? Uh, cooling water pH. Cooling water pH, you would not use. Um, cooling water is typically um, 
going to be at least the conductivity of potable water. So you're going to be at least at 50 uh, microsiemens or up, usually higher than that. Uh, the only deal with cooling water is you want to make sure that you are in in that fluid someplace where you're not going to be getting hit with any steam. You know, it's already your condenser is working properly and it's already condensed and all of that. But cooling water is is not too difficult. Um, the only issues that I really run across uh, doing cooling water, you use a standard pH sensor, it's not you know high purity or anything like that. And um, the issues that I see are if you're not using enough uh, biocide in your cooling tower and you get a lot of uh, biologicals that are going on the sensor and then it gets dirty faster and, and you have to clean it a lot. But I can't, uh, I, I could be missing the boat, it's really early here. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I don't think there's anything special and other than you need to make sure you keep your sensor clean and keep it someplace where you're not going to have any vapor hitting it. It needs to, you know, of course, stay in the cooling water and not in a vapor. Okay, here's another question for you. Mm -hmm. When cleaning our pH meter, would it be beneficial to clean out the old filling solution? Ours develops crystals around the plug every time, uh, and it has a crystallized hunk uh, right inside by where the plug goes. Also, since the last time I refilled the probe, Filling solution, the filling solution seemed to be running out much more quickly than normal. What could this be a sign of? Hmm. Okay. Well, there's that's a. Those are two questions. Uh, yep. The first question is when you clean it. This, if if you have refillable, hopefully this is a high purity uh, sensor. If it's not a high purity sensor, you're probably using the wrong technology for your process. Um, so you have a refillable sensor, and you've got a lot of uh, crystal buildup. So that means that it's becoming more and more concentrated inside. So I would, um, you know, if if you have the type that has like a Honeywell uh, high purity sensor, it has a big reservoir on it. You can uh, pinch off the reservoir uh, or empty the reservoir into you know a container, so you're not wasting that. And then go ahead and clean out. Um, the reference electrode uh, on the inside, you'd have to use DI water to clean it out on the inside and flush it through. And then you can also always take that reference electrode, the face of it, and put it in a little bit of hydrochloric acid to kind of dissolve out those crystals. Um, but typically, I mean, I don't see that a lot with our high purity gear. Uh, so that begs the question in terms of crystallization forming. Um, is all, if this is high purity and it's Honeywell, are you using Honeywell's uh, potassium chloride solution for the high purity? Because you have to. And I never would, I, in fact, I didn't say that when I first started with Honeywell, and I got burned on it six months into my job because I didn't realize that Honeywell does this uh, special microfiltration process down to less than one micron on the potassium chloride, and we also dope it with extra silver ions so that you have a really good electrical connection. So if you're getting crystallization, it could be, uh, you know, you can clean it. Uh, it could be that there's an issue with the um, potassium chloride that you're using, and it could be just old. I mean, all that stuff has a shelf life. It needs to be stored in a cool environment. Usually it's in the chem lab. Most of the time these things, the sinks, and et cetera, are in the chem lab. But you have to have a good environment to store it in, and you don't want to store it over its date. Um, and so I, that's kind of the crystallization issue. When you, after you've cleaned, um, if it's flowing, I would expect it to flow freer because it's, you know, because you've cleaned it. Um, if this is a Honeywell device, cleaning it is not going to cause the pores in the liquid junction to become larger. Um, if it's not a Honeywell device, I can't speak to that without really knowing about the device because it depends on how the um, liquid junction was made, how those pores were created, and what the material is. 
as to whether it might change over time. Um, sometimes if, and let me just add this, if this is high purity and you have a number of devices and they're all, like say you have 10, 10 high purity sensors with reservoirs and all that, and nine of them you have to fill up every three months, and number 10 you have to fill up once a month. That tells me that you probably are pulling a vacuum, that you're pulling a vacuum on the outlet somewhere. It's not hooked up correctly, and when you pull a vacuum, it's going to grab, you know, it's going to take the easiest thing, which is going to be the potassium chloride, and so it will pull that potassium chloride through the reservoir much more quickly. Now, not knowing exactly what you have, I don't know if I've answered your questions, but I've given answers to the general situations that I could think of. Well, we can always follow up. Uh, uh, actually, he just responded that that works. Thank you very much for the answer. Excellent. That, Good. That, that's it for the number of questions for the day. Uh, All right. You want to turn the page, Mike? Sure. All right. Our our next session. Uh, I will. We will get out an announcement uh, on a date and time. Uh, so stay tuned to your email for that. Uh, at this point, Georgie, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. If anybody in our audience does have any specific application questions, feel free to call us at eight hundred. Nine Lessman or 800-953-7626. If you do not know your account manager, feel free to ask for me, Mike DeLaCluse, and I'll make sure that you get taken care of. Stay tuned. The uh, next session will be announced shortly. I do appreciate you uh, hanging with us for the first couple of minutes of technical difficulties. Uh, with a large number of attendees, we had switched technology, so there was a few minutes of learning curve there. Uh, at this point, we will conclude the uh, session. Thank you very much for attending.